So ladies and gentlemen, it's my, uh, my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. I'm Bruce Grocott um, and I chair the Hansard Society, thoroughly enjoyable and satisfying role to fill and you all know the, the purpose of this uh, evening's uh, meeting which is to hear from the speaker, uh, John Burkow, uh, about his thoughts for the next, uh, next uh, the years ahead. The five years is his uh, schedule. Uh, he, like me, knows an awful lot of MPs. I think their, their schedule is more in terms of 12 weeks than five years at the moment, um, uh, which uh, concentrates the mind wonderfully. Uh, and um, uh, this is the fourth time that the speaker, who is one of our co-presidents, for most of you will be familiar, I think, with the Hansard Society, but we have uh, our co-presidents are the Speaker of the House of Commons and the uh, Lord Speaker in the Lords uh, and the three party leaders are uh, s supporters as, as well, the three uh, major parties. Uh, and, um, and the subject to say is looking forward, we are on a fairly tight time scale. We have to finish by 7.30, so there will be the lecture, then there will be a, a question and answer session, which the director of the Hansard Society, Ruth Fox, will be uh, chairing uh, when Mr Speaker has finished his address. I say there is a uh, a, a time limit at work, uh, so I think one of the uh, one of the speakers' uh, uh, time-honoured phrases used weekly at Prime Minister's Question Time of saying this will take as long as it takes, um, whatever the behaviour. I'm afraid that won't apply this evening because we do have to uh, finish pretty well uh, on the dot. So the fourth time that uh, Mr. Speaker's addressed us, and we're delighted to have him here this evening, sponsored and organised by the Hansard Society. So, Mr. Speaker. Bruce, thank you for the warmth of that welcome. Thank you to the Hansard Society and thank you to all of you for bothering to turn up and allowing me to address you this evening. I want to start by assuring those here assembled that it's not my intention to use this occasion for a detailed analysis of Mr. Michael Cockerell's Inside the Commons, <laughs> asking the sort of questions which I suspect that you will all want asked, such as, brackets not, close brackets, why did we have to wait until the last episode for a decent showing of the speaker? <laughs> These matters do not, colleagues, bother me in the slightest. I am, for example, entirely relaxed about the fact that other members of Parliament, such as Robert Halfon, Sarah Champion, and Jenny Willett have been deservedly receiving fan mail by the sackload in recent weeks. Nor do rumours that the principal doorkeeper is about to launch his own one-man show at the Edinburgh Fringe this summer distress me remotely. In a similar spirit, stories that our sergeant-at-arms has been offered substantial amounts of money to appear suggestively in magazines of various forms <laughs> leave me without envy. Although, as he is both a colleague and a friend, my advice to the sergeant would be not to pose dressed in a bedsheet <laughs> and to leave the mace out of it. I am more than happy not just to share, but indeed to concede the limelight. I would nonetheless like to make a few comments about Inside the Commons, but only because they are relevant to my wider remarks this evening. The first comment is to note that, as Michael Cockrell himself has stated, he waited six years to acquire permission to film in the fashion which he did. Indeed, I am informed that similar requests from broadcasters stretch back all the way to the aftermath of the successful documentary, The Royal Family, in 1969. Yet it was in this Parliament, under, I note, this Speaker and this House of Commons Commission, that he was invited in with unprecedented access. This was not, ladies and gentlemen, an uncontentious decision. There were those who feared that at best we were in real danger of letting light in on magic and at worst, that we might turn ourselves into a squalid reality TV event. The safe choice would have been to find an alibi to defer the BBC once more. 
we did not do so. Secondly, I think that what Michael and his team have done is to illuminate to the country at large not merely the importance and idiosyncrasies of this establishment, but the enormity of the challenge which it faces. The administration of the House has both to serve the Chamber and the committees of the House of Commons and to grapple with the management of the parliamentary estate in the modern era. To do the latter successfully itself requires major reform. Finally, my sense is that inside the Commons has been for the most part sympathetically received by those who have viewed it and the understanding of Parliament has been much enhanced by it. All of this I consider to be progress. This is especially true when placed in the right context. The first time I had the honour of speaking to the Hansard Society as Speaker was in September 2009, on, if memory serves me correctly, the 24th of September 2009, three months and two days after my own election as Speaker. Colleagues, the atmosphere around the House then was not happy. Westminster was still shaking, almost literally shaking from the aftershocks of the expenses scandal. I insisted then that this vast self-inflicted wound had wrought more damage upon the House of Commons than even Nazi bombers had done then 68 years previously. And I meant it. As I speak tonight, it is not to claim that all the wrongs of the past have been corrected and that the House of Commons is now in the finest condition imaginable. That would be hyperbole even for this place. This house is in the process of being rebuilt. It is not the finished article. Indeed, realistically, we will never achieve the finished article and it would probably be a fatal conceit to imagine that we could do so. It is in the nature of a human institution to be imperfect and improvement will always be a work in progress. It has, however, at least become possible to discuss the reconstruction of the standing and the reputation of the House without triggering hollow laughter from the vast majority of the population. It is also possible to see what a more advanced project might look like and the next steps which we need to take in order to get there. This will be the essence of my argument this evening. It has also been my personal mission as speaker. Before we embark upon the voyage which I've indicated, we, and especially the Hansard Society, a collection of some of the finest minds in the country, of course, should start by asking the basic question, what should we want from the House of Commons in the early 21st century. This is not as straightforward an inquiry as it might sound. It is my view that our times demand three attributes. First, we should want to be as effective a political actor, to be more precise, a legislature, as possible. This means being a meaningful collective legislator and not a mere arena or just a rubber stamp. It involves scrutiny of executive performance at the highest level. It requires equally scrutiny of the quality of policy, both as an ideal and in terms of practical implementation. It involves the best representation of individuals, constituencies and communities of interest as we can manage. It also demands that we are a true forum for national debates, leading as well as following the dialogue in the wider United Kingdom and not just substituting for the media between the Today programme and Newsnight. In business terms, I think it is possible to identify metrics for success or failure here. Second, we should want to be a body which is closely connected to the public that it serves. The days of automatic deference to institutions, no matter how lengthy or glorious their past, are gone for good, and I, for one, will shed few tears for their passing. The notion that the electorate is or should be content with a role as distant spectator of parliamentary activity, consulted on a one-person, one-vote, once-every-five-years basis, is again, as I see it, nonsense. In all of this, we should be at the cutting edge of exploring the technological means of ensuring that we are open 
to our customers. Once again, to borrow from business, I think there are key performance indicators to apply to us. Finally, colleagues, it's my own conviction that we must aspire to be a model organisation in how we treat those who work here. We may be a Victorian building, but surely do not want to be thought of as a Victorian employer. It was often suggested in the past, on many occasions falsely, but sometimes accurately, that the House of Commons was rather fond of excluding itself as a royal palace from the terms and conditions which it imposed upon others in how they should deal with those who worked in their surroundings. This does not strike me as an ideal state of affairs. To be candid, it has the stench of hypocrisy to it. We should instead have the ambition of demonstrating real leadership within the public sector and beyond that to British society more broadly. Once again, I do not consider this to be an impossible dream, although the nature of the estate makes aspects of this more difficult than for most. And again, I'm sure that there are credible means by which we can determine progress. This then will be my tripod in looking both at the changes of the recent past and setting out where, in my judgment, we should be aiming in the next Parliament. We should seek to accomplish our revival as a political institution, a reconnection with the public, and the realisation of model status as an organisation. I think few fair-minded individuals would dispute the notion that the House of Commons has been a more consequential political institution in the past five years than has been the case for decades. To a degree, it should be admitted that factors other than pure political will have been at work here. The novelty of a coalition administration in Whitehall has undoubtedly altered the dynamics. The arrival of 227 new MPs, and very unusually the fact that both major parties acquired an injection of fresh blood at the same time, has also been an important element. Furthermore, the arrival of a series of issues at home and abroad that cut across traditional party lines has also made life more interesting. However, there have also been a number of important internal changes, which I will briefly outline in no particular order of importance. The first, and my own modest contribution to matters, has been the resurrection of the urgent question, capital U, capital Q, as an instrument of parliamentary inquiry. There were just two UQs awarded by the Speaker between June 2008 and June 2009. Since then, I have allowed one to be put to a minister on 211 occasions, most recently this afternoon. I believe that they have brought a sense of immediacy and of topicality to proceedings in the chamber. I am sure that my successors will do many things quite differently, ladies and gentlemen, to me, but I doubt very much that they will put the UQ back into cold storage. Second, perhaps as a result of the restoration of the UQ to the parliamentary arsenal, ministers have become much more willing to volunteer statements to the House than had become the habit for many years previously. Then there are the fruits of the right committee recommendations enacted by the House five years ago this Wednesday. They have led to the election of the chairs of select committees by the whole House and the choice of committee members by the party caucus concerned. This has had a transformational impact upon the authority and from there upon the ambitions of select committees. Their independence has been entrenched and their horizons broadened. To appear now before a select committee is far from a mundane experience, which no one else is likely to notice. They are pivotal players in politics. So much outstanding work have they done in scrutinising across the field of public policy that I am frankly spoilt for choice in citing examples of it. Andrew Tyree's Treasury Select Committee has advanced the cause of banking reform. Keith Vazit's Home Affairs Select Committee made recommendations on tackling female genital mutilation, which were all accepted by government. John Whittingdale's Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee undertook the most penetrating of inquiries into phone hacking. 
Their conclusions, ladies and gentlemen, reverberate, and the perennial debate about media power and responsibility persists four years later. The Public Accounts Committee, by common consent, chaired formidably by Margaret Hodge, has shone a light on the myriad tax avoidance devices of large corporations. Added to this has been the creation of the Backbench Business Committee, which has seized its share of the parliamentary timetable with enthusiasm and discernment alike. It has staged over 300 debates on issues germane to hundreds of thousands and often millions of our fellow citizens. Invariably, they have at least raised the profile of the subject concerned. On occasion, they have been the catalyst for changes in policy. The debate introduced by Geoffrey Robinson on contaminated blood triggered a government review which spawned an additional 100 to £130 million support for victims. The debate on the Hillsborough disaster led by Steve Rotherham successfully demanded the release of documents allowing a reconsideration of the tragedy that shook the country a quarter of a century ago. The revolt by 81 Conservative MPs on David Nuttall's EU referendum motion arguably shifted his party's policy on an issue which continues <coughs> to divide the nation. Finally, in this context, John Barron's motion that no lethal support should be provided to rebel forces in Syria without the explicit prior consent of Parliament foreshadowed the debate when the House was recalled in August 2013, closing the door on the possibility of military action. So the significance of all this is that just as the UQ is not destined for a return to the deep freeze, I would wager a healthy sum that the new culture of select committees and the ethos of the Backbench Business Committee are realistically here to stay. Added to this, the current Parliament has adopted quite a radical change in sitting hours. This was not, I must emphasise, it was not universally applauded. But I also think that the shift has been frankly better than critics feared. While part of the drive for change was undoubtedly the desire among many MPs for more family-friendly hours, it was also supported by many others whose experience of past parliaments led them to be sceptical that scrutiny was most properly to be secured in the small hours of the morning. It has brought the Palace of Westminster into line with the practices of the modern world. It would, of course, be extremely crude to suggest that one proxy for the effectiveness of the legislature is how many hours members of the executive have to spend upon their feet in the chamber or seated in a select committee chair accounting for their actions. However, crude in this instance does not mean inaccurate. The House has become the centre of national political life once again and that surely should be applauded. There would not be much point in the revival of Parliament if nobody other than Hansard Society members and other atypically well-informed individuals were to notice. Democracy needs not only to be done, but to be seen to be done in order to enjoy the weight that it deserves. Reconnecting Parliament and the public is thus not some sort of public relations exercise, but rather it is absolutely central to its status. The willingness to allow the television cameras in on almost unconditional terms is a part of that. A lot more has happened besides, if not with the same amount of exposure. We have thrown open the doors of the estate to more visitors than ever, and with a variety of tours, including those that are conducted at weekends. I have sought to make Speaker's House itself an asset for Parliament as a whole, and hosted over 750 events, mostly of a charitable or campaigning kind, in the state rooms there. We have started the construction of a new education centre. It should have come a long time ago, but we have started the construction of a new education centre which will revolutionise the experience of school children when they come to see the Palace of Westminster. I had the privilege, ladies and gentlemen, of placing a time capsule under the soil there only last week. 
which, as I observed then, is a rare example of a politician burying something in the sincere hope that it will be uncovered later. <laughs> I can think of no better birthday present for Parliament to allow itself to celebrate its 750th birthday, as we do in 2015, than to start work on a project which will showcase Parliament to pupils as never witnessed before. I've also sought to assist in my own way by a very active speaking programme across the country. In this, I have reinforced the fantastic outreach team now firmly entrenched in the nations and regions of the United Kingdom. There are many other examples of enhanced inclusion that I could mention in depth, but will instead record briefly. These include the Speaker's Lecture Series, which many of you will have seen, possibly in person, but if not, sometimes at distinctly anti-social hours of the day, courtesy of the BBC Parliament channel. That series is now in its fifth year. It's well subscribed, there are plenty of ideas for its continuation and development, and it seems to me to be something that has found favour. I've done all that I can to support the BBC's wonderful Democracy Live initiative. We have developed new computer games for children to bring to life what it is that MPs and Parliament do. I have sought much closer links with academics interested in the House of Commons and championed the return of parliamentary studies to politics courses. Twenty universities are embracing the study of Parliament as a module and they are assisted in teaching it by some of our excellent senior clerks. The UK Youth Parliament is no longer at the fringe but instead now at the heart of what we do. Indeed, it was an early priority for me to ensure that this became so. I opted to chair the first debates of the UK Youth Parliament on a non-sitting Friday in the Chamber in 2009, and I've chaired each and every annual session since. In addition, I accepted an invitation to address the annual conference of the Parliament in 2009 in Canterbury, and I have been pleased to do so each and every year since, in Belfast, in Leeds, in Nottingham, I think, twice, and for as so long as they keep inviting me, I shall regard it as a priority to go. I don't want to outstay my welcome, but if they ask me, I will go. My rationale is simple. If we in the House of Commons, ladies and gentlemen, want to be respected by young people, we must show respect for young people. Respect is not our automatic right, but an earned entitlement. Put another way, respect is a two-way street. And while I'm on this subject, I do just want to reference the growing support for the work of the UK Youth Parliament amongst my parliamentary colleagues, a testament to its efficacy and to the enthusiasm and passion and quality that they exhibit is that the number of colleagues who actively object to the idea of the UK Youth Parliament debating in the Chamber has dwindled almost to insignificance. I'm happy to acknowledge in the presence of the noble Lord Lord Howarth of Newport from the Upper House that the Lords actually beat us to it. They hosted the UK Youth Parliament to our discredit but to their credit before we were ready to do so. But we have now been doing so since 2009 and some people were there at the start in support and Tim Lawton I see in the audience was always a champion of the cause from day one and almost without fail, I think probably without fail, makes a point of being there every year to offer his support and I think that those things matter. You may say that they are symbols but symbols in politics, symbols in life, symbols in business, symbols in public service do matter. We've also attempted to be more imaginative with Westminster Hall as a venue for everything from presidents, popes and Nobel Prize winners, such as Dr. Aung San Suu Kyi, to concerts. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the People's Parliament. It should be a public auditorium and not the preserve of a private society. With that principle in mind, I should like to salute the efforts of the Digital Democracy Commission. I brought this to life some 15 months ago because although the House had taken very serious strides towards embracing new technology and employing that technology to draw the public right into our proceedings, I thought that we had more to learn from the devolved Parliament and Assemblies in the rest of the United Kingdom and indeed, for that matter, from international thought leaders in countries as far-flung and diverse as Chile, Estonia 
and South Korea. The Commission has offered us a host of targets and a comprehensive series of recommendations. Its report has been widely acclaimed, and rightly so. I'm utterly convinced, colleagues, that we can deepen the connection between Parliament and public by this agenda. We also should want to connect better within the parliamentary estate as well as to the wider world. We should want to be, in the very best sense of the term, an example to others. We should never be the unfortunate exception to rules that we have imposed upon others. We should strive instead to be leaders. With that ideal, we've made a number of reforms in the course of this Parliament, some of which I freely admit have not been uncontentious. We have introduced a nursery, not only for the young children of MPs, but for those of employees across the spectrum. This triggered a bruising battle to begin with, but I frankly cannot see it being abolished. We've not reached the progressive heights of the Scottish Parliament, which offers not only a nursery for its own staff, but a creche for the children of visitors, but by the standards of where we were, this is a positive development. I have also to record in this context that just after the establishment of the nursery in September 2010, I went to a study of Parliament group conference in Oxford to speak, if memory serves me correctly, either before dinner or after dinner, but to a gathering of academics and clerks, amongst whose number was a very distinguished former senior clerk in the House who had relatively recently retired, namely Helen Irwin. And Helen, whom some of you may remember, stood up to ask me a procedural question. But before she did so, she said she was pleased to read in the newspapers of the establishment of the nursery and wanted to congratulate all those involved in it. And John Borley, in our audience tonight, played a pivotal role. We worked closely together. He was absolutely dependable in translating aspiration to fact, conception to execution, going to the Westminster City Council and securing planning permission and all the rest. Helen said to me, Mr. Speaker, I don't know if you're aware, but for almost all of my 40 years in the service of the House, the idea of establishing a nursery was periodically canvassed, but nothing ever happened. I'm delighted it has now happened. She said, my only sadness, and she said, it's sadness, not resentment, is that it didn't exist when I was developing my career as a clerk in the House and would have welcomed the childcare opportunity and the work-life balance that it offered. More radical than the nursery in impact in the sense that it has an effect upon more people, we have abolished the vast majority of zero hours contracts, and that's all happened very recently, and we are now a fully accredited London living wage employer. I mean, those things don't just happen, they have to be driven, and you do have to be a bit persistent and insistent about it, because if you don't flag it up, people are not likely to flag it up to you. We've also taken a hard look at the profile of our employees and asked whether we've done enough to ensure really meaningful equality of opportunity. The short answer to that, and I say this in a non-pejorative, non-disparaging, non-offensive way, is as yet, we haven't. There is more to do. We can't rest on our laurels. One aspect of the attempt to bring about change has been the instigation of the Speaker's Parliamentary Placement Scheme, which allows a relatively small number of individuals from disadvantaged backgrounds to have the chance to experience working at the Palace of Westminster. That initiative, colleague, has been a triumph, and I would like publicly to salute Hazel Beers, MP, who came up with the idea and whose energy and enterprise made it happen. She was tremendously supported by Eric Oller Renshaw from the Conservative Party and by Joe Swinson from the Liberal Democrats, but they would be the first to acknowledge that Hazel was very much in the lead in pressing the case, in appealing for political support, and in fighting to secure funds from the private sector. I hope and believe that those who work here and those involved in the cleaning, cooking, and security that are essential to the operation of the House feel more appreciated. All of this has required some very intense micromanagement, and I would like to thank all of those in the House leadership structure who have made it happen. It has also highlighted the need to update our internal organisation. I do not intend to speak at length about the saga surrounding the selection of the Clerk of the House. 
We are now in phase two of the selection process, so an element of PERDA at my end remains appropriate. Yet to say, and I have kept quiet about this matter for several months because I thought it proper that the House should come to a view on the issue, that I am an enthusiast for the recommendations of the Straw Committee on these matters would be an understatement of the highest order. On taking extensive evidence, they could see that cross-party collection of colleagues, that the management of the House was simply not fit for purpose, and they set out constructive proposals to equip us better for the modern world. I am absolutely ecstatic that they reached the conclusions that they did, that they managed to obtain unanimity for their recommendations, and that their findings were then accepted by colleagues <coughs> without dissent in the debate in December and the legislation that came before the House last week. My one regret about all this is that it was not possible to find the consensus required to commission the Straw Committee a year earlier, because if we had, it would have saved us the utter agony of a doomed first attempt. Finding a human being who was a parliamentary expert of the highest repute and a chief executive of stellar managerial form proved predictably impossible. Now that the role has rightly been separated, I argued all along that the clerk should not also be the chief executive, and this has now been agreed by the House, I am confident that we will be able to find a clerk of the House whose constitutional qualifications would make Erskine May proud, and a director general who can take on full time the management of the Commons. I have set out in detail what is in essence an end of term report for the House of Commons in this Parliament. I think that the summary, much improvement but still the potential to develop further, would be a fair assessment of the situation. This is, however, as the late Philip Gould put it in a quite different political context, still an unfinished revolution. What more should we be addressing? I will highlight two matters in the first category of which I have spoken this evening and one in each of the others. In terms of the revival of the House of Commons, there remains one major incomplete element of the right committee conclusions adopted, as I observed earlier, by a vote of the House at least five years ago that has not yet materialised. This absence is despite it being explicitly endorsed as an objective in the coalition agreement between the Conservatives and Liberal Democrats in May 2010. I refer to the creation of a House Business Committee which would take the organisation of official or government activity out of the hands of the usual channels and put them on a formal basis with parties and interests other than the two principal sets of whips represented. At a minimum, I think it would only be right for the whole House to be consulted on whether it was content for the formula which it embraced in March 2010 to be postponed, <coughs> postponed seemingly indefinitely or if it wanted to proceed with it. Better still would be to summon up the spirit of consensus needed to bring the House Business Committee to life. It is the last stage left in asserting the rights of the legislature over the executive. In addition, my views on the currently embarrassing character of bonus discussions are well known. Yet ultimately, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's not my views, not the views of colleagues, <coughs> and not the views of the press gallery that should be uppermost in our minds. Surely the views of the public who support those of us seeking re-election <coughs> to Parliament will shortly and earnestly be seeking should be paramount. PMQs are what, by a huge multiple, the public see and hear of Parliament more than anything else. My submission supported anecdotally wherever I go around the country, and by some polling evidence to boot, is that the public disapprove of the decibel level and the orchestrated barracking. Put simply, if the party leaders want conduct on a Wednesday lunchtime to improve, it will. Post-election, 
there will be an opportunity to achieve change that the public would welcome. On public engagement, the critical challenge is that set out by the Digital Democracy Commission. Once the education centre is fully functioning, we're looking to open it in the late spring or early summer of this year, we will have done close to all that we can do in terms of improving physical access to the estate. It is virtual access that demands our close attention. I will again commend the conclusions of the Commission and urge those who have not yet familiarised themselves with them to do so, whether in print or online. It's almost invidious, ladies and gentlemen, to choose between their conclusions, but I must confess that I am particularly intrigued by the suggestion that we could experiment with inviting in the public to the debate functions of the House by holding e-discussions shortly before the debates held in Westminster Hall, the parallel chamber to the Commons. Dialogue in that forum is somewhat less partisan in tone to the floor of the House and much more inquisitorial in nature, so this does seem to me to be the right place in which to engage in such an innovation. Finally, I return to Parliament as a model organisation. The primary mission here is to translate the recommendations of the Straw Committee into reality. This is not merely making the appropriate changes on an organisational <coughs> chart and identifying the optimal candidates for Clerk of the House and Director General of the House, but in embracing the whole cultural change which is both explicit and implicit in the conclusions of Jack Straw and his colleagues. This is a fabulous institution located in awesome surroundings, yet it must not have the ethos of a museum. It will require bold and imaginative managerial leadership to ensure that we are a parliament fit for purpose and that this Victorian legacy can be rendered practical for contemporary representation. It would, colleagues, be a huge pity if we decided that by the time we'd reached the 200th anniversary of the vast fire which consumed the old parliament and brought this one into being, we had to abandon this site and look elsewhere in order to serve the public interest properly. Yet I will tell you in all candor that unless management of the very highest quality and a not inconsequential sum of public money are deployed on this estate over the next 10 years, that will be the outcome. Thank you very much indeed to the Hansard Society for hosting me and to you for being kind and patient enough to listen. This organisation consists of Parliament's strongest supporters and precisely because of this, at times, amongst its most incisive of critics. When, as I mentioned, I first spoke to you as Speaker, it was at a moment when the terms House of Commons and Duck House had become synonymous. There were those who wondered whether the reputation of the House had sunk so low that it would be impossible to stage any kind of recovery. We have not found Nirvana, but we have left that nadir. When I spoke in September 2009, I set out some ambitious aspirations. Not all of them have been realised, but others which had not even crossed my mind then have been adopted as time went on. I also said then, ladies and gentlemen, that I had sought election as a different kind of speaker, and not different just because of my comparative youth or compact height, for that matter. I referred to my determination to, and I quote, test the elasticity of the office, unquote, which I do not think even my worst enemy would deny that I have done. That I have been a controversial character at times, I freely concede. <coughs> Yet if controversy is the price of being the agent of change, frankly, I consider that to be a bargain worth striking. We have achieved much. There is plenty more to do in the Parliament ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, I look forward to your questions. And meanwhile, once again, thank you very much indeed.
community and organisation, uh, which one that is. Um, okay, questions, please. Okay, gentleman on the front row here first. Uh, gentleman there second, and then the gentleman at the back third. David Hughes from the Press Association. Um, should we see this lecture as a valedictory address on uh, what's been achieved so far, or perhaps a manifesto for the next term? And if so, how long will that next term last? Another journalist, Mr. Speaker, Christopher Hope, Daily Telegraph. Um, you know, well done on all your reforms, which, which you, we applaud many of them in the press gallery. But you have, you have, you, I wonder if you might correct one anomaly from your changes. Would you allow your re-election speaker to be conducted by a secret ballot of MPs rather than an open outcry as it is at the moment? Um, not, not a journalist, a teacher, Giles Marshall, Sutton Grammar School. Um, I just want to take you up on your last bit about the estate and your Wednesday lunchtime comment. Why not build a new chamber that might reflect the demands of a, of a new type of politics instead of reinvesting in what you could still call a museum? Right, OK, now very happy to respond. The lecture was what the lecture was billed as being. I think I wanted to describe what we had achieved thus far and to talk about the possible challenges for the future. I absolutely understand, and you wouldn't be the high-quality journalist that you are if you didn't deploy the loaded language that you do, but it isn't a valedictory address and it isn't a personal manifesto. It's a statement on the basis of getting on for six years' experience of what I think we can claim to have done, and I emphasise we can claim to have done as a House, and a series of, I think, fairly considered and in some cases detailed thoughts as to what we ought to do in the future. So when you ask me about the future, I can confirm that I'm standing for re-election in conformity with convention as the Speaker seeking re-election in the Buckingham constituency. I hope my colleagues will support me for a return to the office of Speaker if I am re-elected for the Buckingham constituency. But one has to take one step at a time. I will appeal to my own voters, and I don't take them for granted. I turn a few moments ago to the subject of earned entitlements, and I return to the subject of earned entitlements. You don't have an entitlement to your constituents' support, you have to earn it. I hope I have earned it, but I'll soon discover in a couple of months' time. And if I'm returned to the House, I will ask the House whether it is willing to return me to the position of Speaker. And if the House elects me as Speaker, you're elected at the start of the Parliament for the Parliament. I'm not resiling from what I've said previously on the subject, but nor am I making any new statement about it. But I mean, I think I'm just describing the factual position, David, as it is. With reference to Christopher Hope, Christopher, it's always a pleasure to see you in any audience, which you greatly enrich by the very fact of your presence, and individually <laughs> and possibly even corporately on behalf of the Taney Telegraph. The means by which the speaker is elected after a general election is a matter for the House of Commons. I mean, there's a very long established procedure on this matter, no different procedure for me than for other speakers. The House can adopt which procedure it wants. So I don't wish to be unkind or discourteous to you in any way, and I'm sure you have undertaken a scholarly inquiry into these matters in best traditions of the Daily Telegraph, but when you say you wonder whether I would allow a secret ballot. It's not a question of what I would allow. I thought the Daily Telegraph, and you personally, believed in adherence to proper procedures. There is a procedure established for the election of the Speaker. And the rationale, basically, ladies and gentlemen, is fairly simple. When the Speaker stands at a general election, and I accept, by the way, this is not without controversy, the Speaker stands as the Speaker seeking re-election. And the reason why that happens is that in our system, it's not true everywhere around the world at all, including in a great many democracies, the Speaker, upon election to the chair, resigns from party and eschews party politics thereafter. And that's what the House wants. For that reason, the Speaker doesn't at a general election then subsequently stand as a party candidate. In many places, in Canada, for example, the Speaker does still stand as a party candidate, but he or she does not in the UK. The Speaker stands 
as a kind of quasi-independent, but to give it its precise title, the Speaker stands as the Speaker seeking re-election, <coughs> normally with the support of the major political parties. At the last election, I enjoyed that support. I hope to enjoy that support at this election. And if the Speaker is returned to the House, the Speaker is asked whether he or she wishes to continue in office, and if the answer is yes, the proposition is put to the House that the immediate past Speaker return to the chair. And the House of Commons does, or has the opportunity to do, what the House of Commons is there to do, ladies and gentlemen, which is to vote. And so I don't think there's anything complicated about it. That's the situation. The third question was why not redesign the chamber? Well, Giles, that's a matter again in a sense, for the House. You know, I am a servant of the House. I don't get the impression that there's majority support for doing that. There is a big debate about restoration and refurbishment of the Palace of Westminster. I'm not aware of a large-scale enthusiasm for a reconfigured chamber. One of my senior colleagues in the House does periodically float the idea, a respected colleague and select committee chair, he would prefer a less adversarial construct. If that were what the House wanted, so be it. But if you're asking me, am I advocating a changed chamber structure, the honest answer is I'm not. You know, ladies and gentlemen, we all live with labels, and to some extent we like labels because they simplify and categorise. And in general terms, you won't be surprised to know that I regard myself as a reformer. I call myself a moderniser. But I'm not against all tradition. You know, somebody said to me the other day, oh, people don't understand why Black Rod bangs on the door of the House of Commons, and said it rather critically. And I said, well, it may not be understood, but that's not an argument for getting rid of that tradition. That tradition is very fundamental to the development of the democratic story in the UK. So it may be we need to do more to educate, but it's not a, an argument for getting rid of it. My own personal view, Giles, it may not be yours, is that there are lots of things wrong with our politics. I don't think the adversarial shape of the chamber is the principal problem. I think there's a cultural change that can be brought about without bringing about a physical change. And you know, I largely echo Churchill, you know, we shape our buildings and thereafter our buildings shape us. You'll probably be aware that in the aftermath of the Second World War, when the Commons Chamber came to be refurbished and restored, there was some question about its size and in particular, its inability to seat all members. Churchill, perhaps you might think inward-looking, was against increasing the size, partly because he thought that it would affect intermittently the acoustics of the place and the intimacy of the theatre of the chamber. And I must admit, on that front, I'm with him. So if you take a different view, I respect it, but I don't share it. Thank you, um, Mr. Speaker, over here. Uh, George Parker from the Financial right. Times. It's been um, reported in some places that the cost of the refurbishment work on the past Westminster could possibly, in some circumstances, run to more than three billion pounds. I just wondered whether that was a figure you thought was in the right ballpark. And secondly, you talked about the possibility that the House might have to decant temporarily outside of Westminster in, in certain circumstances. If that were to happen, would you favour and move somewhere maybe outside London, maybe to the Midlands, maybe to the north, who knows? Thank you. Or even Buckingham. <laughs> um, Ivor Gaby, University of Sussex and Hansard Advisory Council. You just said in, in a moment ago that you accepted, you, you wore the badge of moderniser with pride, I paraphrase. Would you accept that that badge has led you a, to be one of the most controversial speakers of recent times? And if so, is that a matter of regret or pride? Thank you. Uh, John, you're a member of a society. Um, it's more than likely that quite a large uh, amount of power is going to be devolved uh, to strictly to Scotland and Wales. The details obviously remain unclear, but my question is, what's the likely impact upon the House of Commons? Thank you. Okay, well, let's start with George Parker's question on the 
guesstimate of the cost. Yes, it is a figure I recognise, George. I wouldn't put it precisely. If John Thurso from the House of Commons Commission were here and he's attended to these matters very closely, he may even say that that's on the cautious side, and I'm looking at John Borley, who's very considerable expertise in these matters, but who can't possibly be held to a figure at this stage. The truth is we don't know. But is your notion of three billion discombobulated from reality? No, it's no more discombobulated from reality, George, than my experience of 25 years of knowing you, you've ever been. So, you know, as far as I'm aware, it's a perfectly realistic scenario. Do I personally favour decanting? I'll be honest with you, I'm very uneasy, very uneasy about the idea of decanting. So do I start from a position that says, oh, I think we are going to have to decant and let's decant and let's immediately start thinking about where we should go? I admit I don't. I think John knows me well enough. I have the highest regard for him. And you know, we've always treated on level and courteous terms. To know that he knows that I'm uneasy about it. And part of the reason why I'm uneasy about decanting is that I think that once you're out, it can be very difficult to get back. It's the doctrine of the occupied field. I think that if you're out, arguably the pressure to get on with the refurbishment is somewhat reduced. So I don't start from a proposition that, oh yes, let's move out. But I think that we've got to be guided by the evidence. And one of the things that the Commission has agreed is we will take advice on this matter, expert professional <coughs> advice, well beyond just having a new director general in the house, we'll need specialist consultants, reports, and a great deal of work is already being done. And I think we've got to be guided by what we're told. And you know, if a conclusive or a very compelling case can be made for a partial or complete decant, then the House of Commons Commission and the House will have to consider it. I ought to emphasize that if there is a decision to be made on this matter in the next parliament, which there quite likely will be, it will be a decision for the House. It won't be for some committee. It will have to be a decision made, as far as I can see, by the House of Commons. That's the first point. The second point is that when we're talking about cost, you will realise that that is a huge cost that would involve government resources, or resources that effectively in one form or another came from the wider taxpayer. The House of Commons has got a budget of a couple of hundred million pounds, but it doesn't have billions to spend. So there would have to be government buy-in. I mean, at one time, a senior official in the House, knowing that I was less than enthusiastic about this, tried to excite me about it by saying, well, he thought that it could very well be adopted as a project of urban regeneration and might in that context be judged to be very attractive. I must say, I thought that the idea that the public would identify as the prime prospect for urban regeneration, the Palace of Westminster, inhabited as it is by the political class, was optimistic, notwithstanding the improvements in the operation of Parliament that I've noted in recent times. So I've got my doubts. If we were to decamp, should we consider all options, including most certainly you know, a regional option, we should. But just in case some slightly underemployed reporter, I can't imagine that there is an underemployed reporter here, or somebody who hasn't really got a story for tomorrow and is thinking, well, let's see if I can sort of manufacture something. Just in case anybody's planning to say, oh, well, you know, the speaker says, oh, yes, you know, quite a strong chance of moving out and quite a strong chance of moving outside of London. That's not the timbre of my remarks. The thrust of what I'm saying is, wait and see. The cost figure you identified is not unrealistic. As far as Ivor's question is concerned, he says, you know, by the way, I've gone about the work. I've been the controversial speaker. Is that a source of regret or of pride? I think, I'm sorry to hedge it and say both. I think as far as possible, you want to try to achieve consensus. And for many things we have done, if I give the example of the Education Centre, I think it was terrific to have the support of all of my colleagues on the House of Commons Commission, great support from Andrew Lansley and Angela Eagle and John Thurso and Frank Lawrence and Paul Beresford, and that was great. Actually, I had pretty well unanimous support and certainly no explicit opposition on the Commission to the construction of the nursery, though there were some parliamentarians and others who were unenthusiastic. I think that with colleagues, you always want more support rather than less. So if you were to say to me, you know, do I wear as a badge of pride the fact that some colleagues will be critical? No. I think you always want to maximise the level of support and consensus. Where, in relation to particular things, there has been strong criticism from 
parts of the media that are not as notably cerebral or enlightened as that of Mr. Mark Darcy are concerned, I can't say I'm bothered. I mean, the newspapers that, for example, criticized my deployment of the pink triangle, the symbol of LGBT equality, in Speaker's House, in my coat of arms, did not perturb me. If you were to ask me, did I lose any sleep at the thought that, more widely, some representatives of the bigot faction objected to that, I can't say my sleep pattern was disrupted. And I think when some very, very nasty and bigoted people express strong opposition to some of the more progressive things that you do, well then I think you feel, well, you're entitled to your view, but you suffer from the material disadvantage of being wrong and <laughs> goodbye. Somebody once came up to me, is the only person who'd ever done so, and said he thought it was a disgrace that I hosted LGBT equality functions in Speaker's House. That was an absolute disgrace. And I said, well, you know, I can't help your bigotry. That's your problem, not mine. <laughs> what was the last one? Sorry, what was the last of the three? Devolution. Devolution. What will it mean for the House of Commons? Short answers I don't know yet. I think that uh, I ought to avoid getting drawn into the interstices of the debate about devolution. And I don't know what the impact will be. But I suspect that, you know, if you've got strong positions on one side of the argument and another, there is often an attempt when there's a, a thesis and an antithesis to see if some sort of synthesis can be achieved. So I'm not sure necessarily that there will be a dramatic consequence for the House of Commons. And I think most people, even coming at this from different vantage points, would like to preserve the idea of a unitary house, which was a House of Commons for the United Kingdom as a whole. And it may well be that that is achieved alongside bits and pieces of further devolution. But I've got a sort of sense that in the end, it won't be a dramatic Big Bang effect. I think it will probably be a very British concept of working through it in a practical way that probably doesn't totally satisfy anybody, but at least avoids dissatisfying everybody. Meg Russell, uh, Constitution Unit, University College London. Thank you for an excellent end of term report. Thank you. Um, unsurprisingly, I have two questions on the procedural side, short questions. I was interested that in terms of your future agenda, one of the things that you singled out was the Right Committee proposal for the House Business Committee. Um, as the bit of unfinished business in the Right Committee report. There's a lesser noticed piece of unfinished business uh, in the Right Committee report, um, which was that the suggestion that the Chamber, in line with other things that you've said about the power of the Chamber, should actually get to vote on its own agenda every week at the business statement. Um, interestingly, that was never voted upon uh, when the right committee proposals were put to the House, the Whips chose not to put that to the Chamber. It looks like a more modest proposal, but perhaps the fact they didn't put it suggests quite how radical it was. So I wonder what you think about that. And then just second, I know you're trying to keep it short, um, but you mentioned in your SPG lecture last year that one of the other pieces of p potential future reform is uh, reform of the bill committees in the Commons to make them more experts and more... Uh, give them more permanence in line with proposals that we've made at the Constitution Unit. I just wonder whether you would reaffirm that that's a good idea. Um, yeah. Do you mind awfully, Ruth, if I just I treat of this one much. first? No disrespect to anybody else. I, yeah. And I'm sorry if I've got this wrong, Meg. I had thought that, in a sense, voting on the agenda for the House would be, or it doesn't have to be, but could be a feature of the adoption of a House Business Committee. If you had a House Business Committee, which possibly met in public, but certainly had people other than government and opposition whips on it, some backbenchers, maybe a deputy speaker would chair it or whatever, you could then emerge from it with a proposition for the business which could be put to the House. But if I have artificially or mistakenly conflated the two ideas, for the avoidance of doubt, 
I would love the House to vote on its business. The fact that strenuous efforts were made apparently to avoid the House having a chance to decide on that I think tells its own story. I would like us to do that. Do I stand by what I said about bill committees? I do. And by the way, you know, look, there are so many things we could do. I mean, recently there's been a great report by the Hansard Society on the scrutiny of secondary legislation, which is deeply flawed. So, you know, I might say, oh, you know, John, why, why didn't you mention that? Well, I suppose the short answer is because if I had, my lecture would have been significantly longer and I felt that I'd detained you long enough. But I, I stand by all of that. I recall, if I remember rightly, and Meg's been a, an informal unofficial advisor from time to time, because I, I know of her writings and I respect her. Um, you know, you've advised me on matters to do with financial privilege, for example, where I think we've made a little bit of progress in the relations between Commons and Lords. I won't bore you with that now, but we still need to see that through. If I remember rightly, you were not a huge enthusiast for the House Business Committee, or at least I think you thought that its merits were slightly overhyped. But, you know, I remain a supporter of it, but I would like the business of the House to be voted on, I'd like it even to be an amendable motion, and I stand by what I said about the reform of the scrutiny process undertaken by public bill committees. Second question here, and then we can use one down here. Um, just a very quick plug, delegated legislation book, devils in detail, can be bought from the Hansel Society website. <laughs> Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mike Indian, senior political analyst from De Havilland. Um, over the last few months, we've been speaking to prospective MPs from across the country, from various parties and different ilks. And the one thing they have all said to us is that they have a lack of understanding of Parliament, the institution that they're seeking to enter and represent their constituents over the next five years. I wanted to ask you what support you feel could be given to new members at the start of a Parliament and what your personal advice to new MPs would be at the start of the 2015 to hopefully 2020 Parliament. Um, yes, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Jacob Hampel. Uh, I'm a lowly American college student, so I can't say I work for any or represent any institution. Uh, my question to you is that you mentioned in your speech that you were hoping that the Parliament of the United Kingdom would become more of a legislative body that actively scrutinizes legislation. Uh, are you worried at all that that would mean that the uh, that the House would become more like the United States Congress, where the most common criticism is that nothing gets done. Right. Okay. And thank you very much. And as far as induction is concerned, I mean, very detailed work has been done on the induction process. And although I don't say induction, ladies and gentlemen, is by any means perfect, induction for new members is stratospherically superior now, very little to do with me by the way, so please don't think it's a boast on my part, stratospherically superior to what it was when I came into the House in 1997 where I was invited for a drink with a small number of colleagues with my whip and their whip, but there was no formal programme. It was very much an old, I'm sorry, but it was, it was an old sort of army mess attitude, bloody good man, you know, muck in, sort of, you know, find your feet, old boy, you know, don't moan, don't moan, we don't want any moaning, uh, so we'll soon see who the, who the, uh, who the, who the, who the whingers are, etc. You know, that was the attitude, and it was hopelessly, it was a fossilised, totally sort of antediluvian, unprofessional approach in a modern institution, and that's not the case now, and I think it's partly, very substantially, because of terrific work done by House officials, only this morning, John Benger, Dr John Benger, who's got a key role in this, came to see me about aspects of the process of induction. There's a slight danger of overloading people with too many sessions, new members, and therefore they don't come. So we've tried to distill and synthesise it into a digestible format, but a lot of work has been done, and, and I think that's a really good thing. If I advised a new member, what would I advise that new member to do? A couple of things. First of all, attend the chamber. Chamber time in the early period in particular is never wasted. I remember David Miliband once saying to me that he did that. He claimed, I was frankly curious, he claimed that he'd followed my example. He told me at an early stage after he came in in 2001, I think it was, that he had noted that I had spent a lot of time in the chamber in the early period of my election and he decided to do the same. I don't know whether he was following me but I think it was a good thing for him to do. And members who do spend time just sitting and listening and getting the line and length of the pictures, they very rarely regret it. They are much, easily, much more easily accustomed to the ways of the House and what will work and what won't if they do that. And I suppose beyond that, which isn't specifically a, well it is partly a parliamentary point, if I were advising a new member I'd say do something I didn't. 
in the early period, and that is specialised. I made the mistake of not specialising in the early years. I became a sort of jack of all trades and master of none. I think it is better to pick two or three topics in which you specialise. Will we become more like the United States if we become more of a, a scrutiny theatre with nothing getting done? No, I don't think that. I think that there's plenty of scope for government action. I don't think there's a great danger of total logjam and nothing happening. And the government has, in my view, got the right to get its business. <coughs> but I do think that policy scrutinised is likely to end up as better policy. And if we had more pre-legislative scrutiny, we would have fewer bad bills. And if we had more post-legislative scrutiny, post-legislative scrutiny is often not very sexy because people always want to move on to the next topic. We could learn from that post-legislative scrutiny. We should go back on legislation three or four or five years after its enactment and ask, well, how's it working? Has it achieved what it set out to do? Has the law of unintended consequence applied and there have been damaging consequences that we hadn't anticipated? And so on. So no, I'm not too worried about the idea that we'll end up doing nothing. I'm not making a sort of minimal state point at all. I'm not making that <coughs> argument at all. But I do think that the idea that what we suffer from is underactivity and that we need more legislation and more decisions <coughs> is wrong. There's okay. plenty of scope for a more assertive house. Time for just one more very, very quick round. So okay. gentlemen here, gentlemen Uh, Robert Orchard, Robert. Uh, you're obviously, uh, Mr. Speaker, very bruised, understandably, by the uh, great furore over the appointment of the Chief Executive. You talked about the utter agony of a doomed first attempt. You said you had kept quiet for several months about this. Were you traduced in the way that you were blamed for this? And secondly, totally different fixed-term Parliament Act. I'm not asking you to speculate on the next election, but if we have some sort of hung Parliament, then does it put things in a straitjacket and will we have a very unstable a situation because people don't really understand how significant that act is. Thank you. Um, Karan Power, um, sixth form student at Southern Grammar School. Um, obviously Parliament is meant to be a representative body but um, seemingly it is not becoming an uh, accurate microcosm of society um, in terms of gender, ethnicity or religion. Uh, do you feel this has any sort of negative effects on the, on the legislative or scrutinising function of Parliament? Um, what would, would you like the power suggested by Angela Eagle this week to be able to send MPs to a sort of 15-minute sin bin if they're getting a little bit overactive? The suggestion at the moment is you either, either have to put up with what they're doing or there's a nuclear weapon of excluding them for quite a long time and nothing in between. Thank you very much. As to whether there would be, Robert, instability in a new parliament, you know, I, I'm sorry to give you a sort of non-committal answer, but, you know, I don't know. The only thing I'd say is I think people do in parliament have a habit of wanting to try to make whatever arrangement is the result of the voters' votes work. And so, you know, I can't rule out the possibility of some instability and people now and again talk about, you know, there might be... Sorry. Parliament specifically. specifically. Well, the Fixed Term Parliament Act is there and we have to work within the context of it unless it is overturned. You know, and I don't think it's for me to say whether it will be overturned or not. I'm not aware that any I'm not aware at this stage that anybody is actively arguing for that. And you know, am I anticipating that at this stage? Uh, the, the short answer is I'm not anticipating that at this stage at all. And in terms of you know, what you say, I'm obviously very bruised. No, I, I suppose I referred to it as the doomed first attempt and, you know, as a, an unfortunate experience because everybody worked hard. And I'm not complaining. I mean, I'm not complaining. That's pointless. Everybody worked very hard. All sorts of people who weren't there and didn't know and couldn't say nevertheless thought that they were there and did know and could say. Uh, but that's life. You know, people offer opinions, you know, in some cases volunteered with all the extreme self-assurance of complete ignorance of the relevant subject. We were there, those of us who sat on the selection opinion, we worked extremely hard to try to get a good outcome. So it was a pity it didn't work. But am I bruised? No, I'm not. I mean, I've never been bruised in my life. <laughs> well, you know, I think, I, think once I, I think once in a doubles match I was hit, inadvertently I must say, and by an opponent's racket. And when I was a junior 
tennis player, and on that occasion I was bruised, but, uh, but not otherwise. No, I genuinely don't feel bruised at all. I'm extremely upbeat. I don't think I've been wandering around the parliamentary estate with a dismal countenance. And so, no, I mean, I think you, you just get on with things, you know. And so I certainly don't regard myself as bruised. No, we've got to get it right second time round. Uh, I certainly won't say that I choreographed all this deliberately to end up where we are now. I could have done with out, you know, the disruption, and I'm sure other people could have done without the disruption. We would rather have had a result first time round. But actually, I'm sorry to just have to put it like this, I argued for a separation of roles. I met with very, very, very stubborn resistance to any change. And so we recruited to the traditional role of clerk and chief executive, even though I thought it entailed a conflation of two very disparate and, for the most part, usually incompatible skill sets. Now, as a result of Jack Straw and his committee's work, it seemed to me, to be honest, a fairly prosaic and commonsensical point that the skills to be a top quality procedural advisor and the skills to be a top flight chief executive were different has been acknowledged. And we're going to get two people with a commitment to make it cost neutral. Just let me, sorry, every, the other two? Mark and... The gentleman about the not being a representative body? For yeah, I think that does matter. Do I think that matters? I can't prove that it affects particular policies. What I would say is that since we've had a larger influx of female colleagues, the quality of our debates on a great many issues across the piece, and actually often, though it hasn't unfortunately brought everybody to order, far superior behaviour have resulted because I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that no female members ever shout in the House, but on the whole, female members of the House behave much better. They're used to arguing their case, but not to shouting their heads off. They, they are on the whole less aggressive, every bit as passionate, every bit as robust, every bit as tough, every bit as searching, but less aggressive. That's been a beneficial consequence. The debates we have about all sorts of subjects are much better for having more female members and more ethnic minority members. Do we have to have a mirror image of the population? No, but do I think it matters that we're still sort of largely male dominated, I do. I think we need more women, more members of the ethnic minorities, and if I may say so, more people from working class backgrounds. We are still overwhelmingly a white male middle to upper middle class institution. And to those who say it doesn't matter, I think they're wrong. And sometimes when people say oh, all of this political correctness, it doesn't matter at all, you know, all this talk about having more women and more black people and so on and so forth. Usually, usually the people who say that are male, white, and unaffected by the situation concerned. Mark, Darcy, sorry, your last question. Yeah, and I think there is merit in it. It's not for me to decide. It's for the House to decide. I wrote to the party leaders about Prime Minister's question some several months ago. You'll recall that David Cameron talked about how he disapproved of Punch and Judy and wanted a more reasoned dialogue at Prime Minister's questions. That was after he became leader of the Conservative Party. And you'll know that Ed Miliband has emphasised the need for reasoned debate. And Andrew Regal has just produced this Sinbin proposal. You must ask Angela, but it is similar to and may even be modelled on that which applies in the Australian. Parliament. The problem at the moment is that you've got the ultimate sanction of throwing out a particular member, which is then potentially subject to a vote of the House, or suspending the sitting altogether, which I confess I haven't done. So as an idea and a, an intermediate step, some people may think that a right for the chair to deal with particular instances of disorder by a kind of temporary suspension uh, has merit. But in case anybody says, oh, you know, Burko's pressing for it, I'm not pressing for it. I'm saying I think it has merit, and I am factually and as fairly as I can, and as straightforwardly as I can, answering a question from an esteemed BBC journalist. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. On that score, I'm sorry to those of you who we didn't manage to get questions from um, for the pressing the time. Um, can I ask you to join me in thanking Mr. Speaker for once again a great review of the year. <laughs> Tonight's uh, event will be on BBC Parliament on Saturday.
Saturday evening, 9pm I believe, and after that probably there for an iPlayer, and uh, a date for your diary. Some of the issues that the speaker has referred to tonight, um, and he, he, he referenced in his speech things like key performance indicators for Parliament, well those to some extent are contained in the Hansel Society's annual uh, audit of political engagement, the annual health check in our democracy. The next audit will be published on Wednesday, March 25th. Um, it will be in the Macmillan Room uh, across the way here in, in Port College House, and you'll be able to book seats at that launch um, on our website later this week. So on that score, once again, can I just join me in thanking the speaker, and I hope you'll take care of